Good morning. How's everyone? Glad to see you. We'll be in Matthew chapter 5 this morning, actually for the next two weeks in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, so while you're turning over there, let me just say I love all of you that have latched on to hashtag blessed and started tagging me online. It's wonderful. Somebody actually found two gallons of bluebell oatmeal cream pie ice cream this week, and we're hashtag blessed. And uh, I'm really, that's awesome. I've heard it tastes good. How many of you are fans? I, Jacques Underpont. It must be good if Jacques likes it. All right, Matthew chapter 5. Just make sure you're turning over there. Two things as we uh, get started this morning. First of all, next Sunday we have a team leaving to, a small team, leaving to the Middle East to go re-engage our uh, local partners there. We have not been since uh, in person since COVID began. And so we have a team of three going there, uh, Angela, Cade, and uh, Chris. Angela being my wife, so I, I would love your prayers uh, for them as they, uh, as they go. Um, also, if you haven't been watching the news lately, a rocket uh, launches on Monday uh, with the Artemis program, and some of our people in our church have been working on that for a very, very, very long time. So just keep that in your prayers and uh, thankful for that. Okay, I'm going to get you to stand up one more time. We're going to read one verse, so you won't be standing long. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. This is buried in the introduction to Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount. If you're our guest, we say this phrase, the very words, at the end of the main text reading, just to distinguish God's word from my own. Here's what the scripture says. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You can be seated. That's it. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So what does it mean to be blessed? And we've talked about this the last two weeks, and I'll just reiterate it now that sort of what we think of when we think of being blessed in 21st century American, I'll say Christian-ish culture, is the idea of like material blessing or victorious blessing or, you know, I found, I found two gallons of my favorite ice cream blessing or I'm on vacation blessing or my football team won blessing, those kinds of blessings, right? But the scripture is really uh, very clear on what it means to be blessed. And so what I wanted to do is take six weeks. We've been into, will be, this is the third one. I wanted to take six weeks and, and pull six, six passages of scripture that really talk about what it means to be blessed. And today we come to Matthew 5, 5, which is uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. It says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So what is meant by meek? I'm, you know, most of you probably didn't use that word all week long meek in your vocabulary. Uh, some people equate meek with weak, right? Anyone? Meek with weak. So some people would say meek is just kind of like weak with an M, uh, but it's not. Jesus actually describes himself as meek. And I want to read that to you out of Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. It says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle. That word gentle is the same word in Greek as this word in Matthew 5, 5, meek. I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if we are followers of Jesus, we are disciples of Jesus, what that means is that we're watching Jesus all the time, we're fixing our eyes on him, and we, we are seeking to be like him. And he's put his spirit inside of us to sort of help us walk with him and like him. And so he says of himself, for I am gentle or meek and lowly in heart. What does this mean? Part of meekness, if that's a word, is being unprovocable, unprovocable. How many of you are easily provocable? You just want to own it right here. You don't have to come to the front. You can just raise your, eye, your, you know, your hand, look at me in the eyes, whatever. Check the box on the card. I'm provocable. Um, uh, part of being meek is being unprovocable. So let me give you a, a passage, Luke 22, 63 to 65. This is right in the middle of Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. 
And let me just remind you who Jesus is before we, before we read this. Uh, Jesus is the one that the scripture says all things were created by him, by him, through him, and for him. All things were created by him, through him, and for him. He's the one that said all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, which means he is the pinnacle of all authority in heaven and earth. The scripture describes him as supreme, paramount, first, primary. His titles are Lord, Prince, Master, God. So remember that as we read this, Luke 22, 63 to 65, right in the middle of his uh, arrest as he was being held, it says, now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. Now, what if you were the pinnacle of all authority in heaven and on earth? What if everything had been created uh, by you and through you and for you, including these that were mocking you in the moment? Asking him, prophesy. Who struck you as he's blindfolded? It's a mockery, right? It seems prov- provocative. It seems like, I think, if I was Jesus, I would have been like, beep, shh, <laughs> over, you know? But I'm not Jesus. He's unprovocable in that moment. He says nothing. He says nothing. We live in a provocative world among a provoking people. Have you noticed? We live right in the middle of a culture that is very provocative, and we often have the opportunity to be uh, provoked. It seems that many of us are very provocable, and I I would say to you that I struggle with this maybe even more than than most of of you. I remember uh, fifth grade. Uh, fifth grade was an awkward year for me. I don't know about any of you, but fifth grade was a weird year for me. And what made it worse is my mom became the permanent substitute teacher in my homeroom classroom for the, like six months because my teacher went on bed rest. And I was not happy about that. Some people would be, I was not happy about that. And what I did not anticipate was that also other people in the class would not like my mom as their teacher. And I wouldn't like that even worse than, not, than having my mom as a teacher. And so there's one kid, this fifth grade kid named Gary. I would say his last name, but he might be like, I don't know, president of something now. And, you know, who knows? But there was this kid, Gary. And uh, Gary called my mom a very bad name, where I could hear it. And I literally said to him, meet me at the sign after school. (laughs) And he said, okay, no problem. And he showed up. And when he showed up, he actually had like weightlifting gloves. And I was like, I didn't know you had to have weightlifting gloves to fight. And I had never been in a fight. And to that moment, I had never been in a fight in my life. But I was provoked. This guy called my mom a really bad name. Who doesn't like it when people talk about their, their mom, right? I don't. Come on. You know, it's a thing. It should be a thing. And so uh, to make a long story short, he beat me up. At, <laughs> he beat me up so bad. I mean, I got nailed, right? Uh, it took probably like two minutes. I realized, like, I hope the principal sees this, you know, because that's going to be my only hope. And... Uh, but there was justice. So three years went by, and uh, we went to different intermediate schools, and three years went by, and I walk out onto the wrestling match at 119 pounds, and there's Gary on the other side. And I'm like, oh, yeah, because a lot changes in three years and a little training, right? And so I smashed him, I smashed him. I mean, like 30 seconds, head throw, pin. I was like, that's for my mom. <clears throat> been waiting, you know. I don't know where he is now, but I've been provocable for a very long, very long time. Angela uh, knows of a soccer game I was in where a kid spit in my face. I hammered him in the nose, broke it. He's down. Everybody's down. UIL sanctioned Pastor Brian (laughs) Haynes. 
all on video for everyone to see. I hope it's not still out there somewhere. It might, might be. I've been provocable for a really long time, and uh, even now, like, sometimes I have to work on not being provocable. Um, social media is the worst for being provo- provoked. Did you know that? Like, people, people can really get under your skin on social media. It's not just me that's easily provoked on social media. It's a lot of us that are easily provoked. We want to, like, come back with the next, you know, pithy saying, the better argument, all those kinds of things. But what I find when I look at Jesus and I think about what does it mean to be blessed? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Um, A lot of people, you know, you think about Jesus as being uh, meek and part of that being unprovocable. You might think of, well, there was that time Jesus overturned the tables in the temple. Remember that time? It's actually recorded in three different places in the Gospels. Jesus rides into Jerusalem. He comes to the table, uh, to the temple, and the Sadducees are there. Uh, They are selling, they're overpricing sacrificial items, pigeons, and those kinds of things. And, and really, the religious leaders are taking from the poor who are there just to worship God. Right? It's, a, it's a problem. Um, when you read the passage of Scripture, Jesus wasn't provoked. He was righteous in his anger. He was righteous in what he did and how he did it. And it was for the purpose of God called by God to remind the people, if you look at everything after it, he taught. It says he said. It does say he turned over the the tables. I would have enjoyed, I think, seeing that. But he, he, he taught my father's house to be a house of prayer. That's way different than being provoked. No one at that moment was going, Jesus, you're dumb. You know, they're not provoking him. He shows up. And he, and he offers righteous anger. There's, there's a difference between being provocable, being easily provoked, and exhibiting a righteous anger. So part of this, then, it, what does it mean to be meek? Jesus describes himself that way. He also s- shows us that he's, he's unprovocable in ways that are unimaginable uh, to me. I think also part of this meekness is a humility. Paul describes Jesus like this in Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now again, we said Jesus is supreme. He's primary. Everything was created by him and for him and through him. Yet in his incarnation, being born in Bethlehem in a meager town, strapping on the skin of an infant, leaving the throne room of heaven, walking a meager lifestyle, being mocked toward the end of his life, hung on a cross, which is a curse in that culture, the worst kind of death, out in the middle of everyone so that everybody could see while they were walking by. All of this is an extreme act of humility. I have a friend, Steve Besner, that I hear constantly remind people, you know, people think about what they would do if they knew they had only had one day or two days or three days to live and they make a list like I'd get three I get three gallons of oatmeal cream pie uh, ice cream whatever you know I'd tell oh, here's what Jesus did Jesus washed his disciples feet he served them it was, it was the ultimate act of humility. So when we think about being meek, our, our best example is Jesus. Part of that meekness is being unprovocable. Part of that meekness is just an, ex, an exhibit of humility, true humility. The best different definition I've ever heard for the word meek is, the, is this, three words, strength under control. Strength under control. And the example is a strong war horse in complete submission to his master. 
If that strength of that horse wasn't in submission to his master, it would be out of control and wreak havoc. But in submission to his master, he's meek and pur- purpose- purposeful to the master. When we are meek, we are not passive or cowering to others, to philosophies, to different ways of thinking. We are not wallflowers, but we are submitting to our Lord. The meek choose the way of patient faith instead of self-assertion. It is strength under control. Jesus is the ultimate example of it. Again, I, I get hung up on this phrase. He's praying into the, in the garden to his father, and he knows he's about to go to the cross. He asks the father for relief if there's any other way. But then he says, yet not my will, but yours be done. Strength under control of the father. And this is how we need to live as well as Christians. The second thing we learn here in Matthew chapter 5.5 five is that there is an inheritance for the meek. It says in 5.5, in five, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now this meekness brings the blessing of an, earth, an, an inheriting of the earth. Now believe it or not, Jesus is quoting Psalm 37.11. Guess what it says? But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant Peace. And certainly in Psalm 37 11, in that context, the inheritance of the land is the promised land once inhabited by wicked people who, who was then given to the people of Israel by God. And in the end, the wicked will be destroyed, leaving the meek in sole possession. That's the perspective of Psalm 37 11. In Matthew 5 5, Jesus echoes this concept for the Christian. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, pointing not to a particular geography, a particular land, but looking forward to inhabiting uh, and ultimately ruling with Christ, enjoying an entirely restored heaven and earth, a new Jerusalem. This is the inheritance and the blessing promised to the meek. How, How do I think about that? Well... When we are meek, the scripture says we are blessed. It doesn't feel like it sometimes in our culture, though. And so what you have to look at is the long game. What is promised by the one who is saying, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And what is promised is complete restoration of all things. A new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem where there's no more tears, no more crying, no more pain anymore. All sin is outside the camp at that point. There's no wound by sin, no impact of sin, no temptation to sin. It's going to be shalom, perfect, like the Garden of Eden all over again, only better. And that's the promise. But in these days, we are to walk like blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Not weak meek. There's a difference. What does this mean for you and for me as followers of Jesus? Uh, I kind of loathe personality tests and, and things like the Enneagram. Does anybody ever have to take those things at work or just for fun? Or come, Please tell me. Some of you have, right? So you have to, and, and some, sometimes you just want to, trying to figure out who you are. And there's some, there's some good to help us understand exactly what we are. But sometimes I think those personality tests or behavioral inventories just give us the opportunity to say, on a bad day, we get to be stupid, right? Like mine, the disc inventory, it says, at my best, I'm competent, assertive, and ambitious. And at my worst, I'm impatient, insensitive, and demanding. So when I'm impatient and sensitive and demanding, I might like to say to myself, if I believe the gospel of the Enneagram, it's okay because that's how I'm wired. I give myself a pass. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, Actually, that was the disc inventory. My Enneagram is even worse. It says... Uh, at my best, I'm helpful, big-hearted, vivacious. I don't even know what that 
means. And encouraging. And at my worst, I'm arrogant, secretly competitive, boastful, and opportunistic. I've just bared all my, my soul to you. I, 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 don't, I don't get to have a day where it's okay to be arrogant, secretly competitive, boastful, and opportunistic in Christ. All that would be sin. All that would be sin. I can't just say, like, I'm wired that way. On a, on a bad day, it's how I'm going to react. Angela, you should just get used to it because, you know, I won't have many bad days, but when I do, you know. No, Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Sometimes we look at people that are arrogant, opportunistic, all those kinds of things, and we see that they climb ladders or they gain wealth, and, and we think to them, ourselves, like, why, do, why can't we have that? That's not blessed. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It's different. It is a completely different way of thinking. In the kingdom of Jesus, blessed are the meek. We should take this to heart and conform to the nature of our Lord. I can't tell you how much of a struggle daily it is to be conformed to Christ. Because I know the guy that was UIL sanctioned. His, his name is Brian. I know it's deep in my heart. I know that I have to stay close to be conformed to Christ. And I have to constantly remind myself from the scriptures, what is blessing really? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Maybe, and when we think about this, we need to pray, maybe start, start out like this. Maybe we need to pray just, just to be more like Christ, to be less provocable, to be more humble, to exhibit strength under control and submission to God. I was thinking about, okay, so we leave this sermon. We've talked about meek. Everybody remembers, you know, Brian punched some guy, but... What is the takeaway? What is the takeaway? A couple really practical things. You've got to be meek, not weak. Meek, not weak. Okay. How do you be meek not, meek, not weak? Well, during COVID, we started using this phrase, hey, we're going to gather in person and online. Welcome to all of you that are online, by the way. In person and online. Well, we need to be meek, not weak, in person and online. In person, online, be the same. Meek and not weak. Strength under control of the master who is Jesus in person and online. We need to exhibit just what Jesus exhibited in his meekness. Truth and love. Jesus was not weak. He always told the truth. But he did it in love. Always in love. I mean, if you study some of the phraseology, things that Jesus said to like the Pharisees, the religious leaders, woe to you. That's truth. Because of X, Y, or Z, he wasn't weak. He was meek. We need to be this way. We have to, sometimes we think to ourselves, you know, like, okay, we, we, are the, we have the Bible. We know it's all true. We stood up and said on Sunday the very words. We have this thing that we carry with us out there, and, and, and we've got to engage the culture. And sometimes we do it well, and sometimes we don't engage at all, and sometimes, and sometimes we engage poorly. Peter said to people that were living in a culture a lot like us, hey, be ready to always give an answer for your hope, but do it with gentleness, that's the word meek, and respect. Gentleness and respect. You're never going to win people by winning an argument. You're going to win them with truth and love. Truth and love. So maybe we need to be meek and not weak in person online. Maybe we need to exhibit truth and love. Maybe, maybe we need to embrace humility instead of uh, pride. Maybe we need to embrace humility in, in, instead of pride. I often think, again, of Jesus hanging on a cross, and they're telling him, if, if you're the son of God, call an angel 
or just get yourself off the cross. They're mocking him, and he's just so meek to fulfill the purpose of God for the world, the strength under control. He is going to have that eighth grade wrestling match moment where he rises from the dead on the third day. But he's going to go through. And you are too. You're going to go through before everything is restored. Everything is right. Before you inherit the land. And so maybe we just need to embrace humility and, and, and push away pride with in, intentionality. Maybe we need to exercise discipline. Like, don't bite on the provocation. Don't bite on the provocation. When people try to provoke, don't bite. It's easier said than done. But this is true. We need to be meek, not weak, and not bite on the provocation. The fifth thing I think is this, and the last, when we're meek and not weak, we exhibit anger in a righteous way. Not in a provoking way to say, I don't, I don't like what you're saying about, provocative way, I don't, I don't like what you're saying about me that's formed in pride. But we exercise anger in righteous ways that are, for, that are forwarding to the purpose of God. And these are few and far between. Few and far between. Um, meek, not weak. This is the shortest verse and the hardest application. I think for people like you and me in the context that we live in, the culture that we live in, um, if, 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 if a Roman in the first century was listening to the Sermon on the Mount, which is very possible because, you know, like Capernaum, where Romans were, it's a Jewish town, but there's a, a, a garrison stationed there. It's right down the hill from where the Sermon on the Mount was preached. And if a Roman is hearing, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. A Roman would be thinking, and this is why they will never overcome Rome. Because blessed are the strong, for we will take over the earth. That's the Roman way. It's completely counterculture for a Western thinker, right? It's also still completely countercultural for us as Westerners to think blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Yet this is the blessing. This is the way. This is the way of Jesus. Next week, if you thought this one was hard, next week, blessed are the peacemakers. Not peacekeepers. Peacemakers. That's a big one too. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Ask the Lord to speak to you. Father, it is on our heart to experience the kind of blessed life that you call us to for eternity. And as we read these scriptures that point to what it means to be blessed, Father, we're challenged as people, convicted as people. I pray right now, Lord, would you, by your spirit, convict us in ways, show us the ways that we need to become more meek. If we struggle with pride, Lord, bring us toward humility Help us to recognize these things. Father, use this body of Christ to be strong and submissive to you in the culture. Make them meek. And in that way, make them blessed. Help them to look like you, to walk like you, to be like you in the culture that they live in every day. Father, we're thankful for your straightforward words. Jesus, we thank you for your example for what it means to be meek. We look forward to the inheritance that is to come because of you, Jesus. Help us to be meek, not weak. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.